Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, and my guest this week is a speaker, a coach, a play facilitator, and all-around fun person. She's even certified in Lego. Her name is Kirsten Anderson, and we're going to talk with her about what it's like to play for a living. You can find her at Kirsten Playing on social media or integrateplay.com. You can find Playful Humans at playfulhumans.com. There is a playfulness quiz there. You can find out what kind of playful personality you are, or you can join the club. That's what we're here for, collecting other playful humans that are adults trying to rediscover the power of play. Check it out, playfulhumans.com. Welcome, Kirsten. We like to start with the joke of the week here on the podcast. The joke of the week is brought to you by Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, kneel before him, Buzz Aldrin. All right. The joke of the week is, what is the astronaut's favorite part of the computer? You tell. The space bar. Oh, uh, of course. Uh, do you have a joke for us? Well, you know, I, I you may have noticed that a lot of people call their toilet the John, but uh, my hu- my husband's middle name is John. My dad's mi- my dad's first name is John, so we prefer to call it the gym. And then also, I get to say in the morning, first thing in the morning, I go to the gym every day. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. I'm going to start using that uh, for sure uh, because. I would like to be able to shout out that I go to the gym maybe more than I, I do, but that uh, humor. sounds like a personal problem for me maybe, and not so much about play. So tell us uh, what you've been doing. You are a certified Lego play facilitator, which is fun. And you work with corporates, uh, training, culture building, team building activities, as well as public speaking for events and, and conferences. How did you get into that? And, and how long have you been doing it? Yeah, I sold my toy store. I was in the toy industry for 25 years before I uh, shifted gears and decided, hey, what else? Uh, You know, I was kind of on a mission to bring play to the adult world and figuring it would trickle down to teenagers, middle schoolers, elementary school kids if we got more adults valuing it, especially at work. And so after really diving into that and being invited to speak at a fair number of places. My first keynote, paid keynote, was in Denmark, of all places. So that was exciting. And I had to go straight through um, the city where uh, LEGO was invented and is still the headquarters. So um, 2016 was when I got certified in LEGO Serious Play. And it was uh, like a shining moment. The light shone down on the LEGO. And I was like, oh, (laughs) this is awesome. This is a perfect fit for me. Well, I am uh, a little bit jealous. I'm just going to be honest because I love Lego. If you could see over here to the side, there's a uh, large bookshelf of more Star Wars Legos than my wife would like to admit. And um, I really love it. But also I found that it's a great metaphor and way to talk about play because there's the way to follow the kit and follow the instructions and it's nice and neat and organized and you can feel like you accomplished something and you did a nice build and maybe you show it off or, or take a picture and it looks great. But then there's also the free Lego play and, and the classic way of just building with different pieces and making something creative out of your own mind. And I, I feel like so much of the metaphors of, of play with Lego have a lot to do with our work and life. What, what have you discovered there? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing when you have people sit down and build, and there's no instructions. There's no, uh, you know, doing it from a kit or, you know, like, okay, everybody, we're all going to build the same thing. It's you build your answer to, to a powerful question. And so really you could be using clay or you could be using any number of tools, but Lego is so familiar and intuitive the way it fits together that whether someone has Lego experience or not, it's, it's so natural. And uh, when everyone is given equal time to tell their story and they're discussing something, they're actually digging into the unconscious as they tell their story. And so what they initially thought that they were building, other layers come when they tell 
you know, when they even spend one minute describing what they built. So it's super powerful to unblock people to get, you know, deeper into the potential of a problem, a challenge, because, you know, we're not there, you know, people haven't brought me in there just to play and have fun. That's a byproduct of what we're doing. And it's super engaging that way. And people concentrate and they remember it that much more and they're able to dig into the challenge deeper. But really, it's for a reason, like they want to be more creative or innovative. There's a specific topic around that or it's around um, resilience and they want to talk about, you know, how do they move forward with a resiliency uh, for their team or strategy or um, a big one is connection and belonging, especially, especially now mm. when people are feeling so disconnected. Yeah, I want to dive into that too, because I, I feel like with your expertise as a play professional, you know some of the benefits of play that maybe adults have forgotten. If you are going to just maybe list some common misconceptions for leaders or for burnt out adults, what would you say the common misconceptions are and what are some of the benefits that go along with them if you can change their mind? Well, I'd like to write a whole book on that. Just that, right? <laughs> Me too. Yeah. The, the misconceptions uh, are a plenty. And, you know, why aren't adults playing, I feel, is what you're asking. And, uh, you know, for the, when I'm talking to CEOs, one of the top ones would be fear. And, you know, and that's usually what stops us from doing most things in life, right? So fear, yeah. fear of judgment, really fear of, you know, how, how will my um, peers judge me? How will the people that are um, in this hierarchy judge me like throughout the organization, my colleagues, how will um, my customers judge me? How will my competitors judge me? Like they really list it off all of them. And because they feel uh, unjustifiably in most cases that they, they will be viewed as unprofessional, not taking their work seriously, as uh, not working hard, you know, that they're not a hard worker. Mm -hmm. And of course, none of these things are true. I and mean, we just need to look at other successful people who have prioritized play, uh, have embedded it within their culture to see how that can be the opposite of true, that you can be playful, you can, you know, really utilize play and a playful mindset and playfulness to um, help you not burn out to actually that whole paradox of um, playfulness and productivity again. Yeah, I find it fascinating. I think when you look at the research, some of the top highest paid professionals in the, the world are people who play for a living. Like you don't play sport or work sports. You don't work acting. You don't uh, even work doctor or work politics. You play all of those things. <laughs> and it's really interesting to me too that um, we think, and we've kind of been trained and brainwashed in, that fitting in is the way to get ahead or get an A. But as soon as you're done with school, that's not true anymore. The way to get ahead is to stand out and be different and separate yourself and your company from other people in the market and, and to bring more value and creativity than, than somebody else. So I'm surprised kind of that the, the market or the masses haven't caught on to that as much yet. Um, do, you, do you feel like there's a, a secret advantage or is it just like you, what you said, everybody is, is kind of shy and afraid to, to look silly and it's that first 20 years that's holding us back? Well, I think we're riding a wave, Mike. I think we are um, surfing this tsunami that is coming and it is uh, valuing a more human culture first um, workplace. And, you know, it's, it's slow. Uh, you know, I would like to see it move faster. You know, I'd love to see this yeah. uh, globally and in every industry, but there are certain industries that have embraced it faster than others. So I work a lot in the tech industry that is more nice. open. And why are they more open? Well, they're open because they see that if they're not creative and innovative and constantly evolving, they will be shuttered. They will be shut down. They will be obsolete. And they see all the stories of what happens to companies that stick to the status quo. Well, nothing new is created without play, I always say, right? So you need to keep playing with ideas. And, you know, you were talking about different roles like doctors and sports and music and uh, acting. Well, what about science too? When I sit, when I talk to um, teenagers or adults or executives about creativity, I, I say, you know, like 
the plumber that comes to your house is creative. They are problem solving. They are figuring out, you know, how am I going to get this pipe to work around this um, problem? How, and the scientists, they are creative. It's not just left brain, right brain. You, you are out there trying to do something different, something a little weird, you know, follow your path of curiosity, which is like the ultimate in, you know, playful mindset. So I think that as industries see the benefits on so many um, lines of their of their books, you know, the financial impact, then people start to move more towards play. So you can yeah. see in advertising and in marketing that some, you know, creative types will use a playfulness within their advertising in certain industries. You see it in, um, in some culture circles, like even um, Zappos, right, is a great example of that, or Virgin Airlines using playfulness within their culture. And so, yeah, some institutions will be slower to come on board, but I am determined that everyone, even, you know, like the oil industry, you know, like the, every, you know, even the financial industry, they will, they will see the benefits when they see that it hits the bottom line for their people to be happier, their customers to be happier, and for their products and services to be um, more in tune with, um, with their ultimate goals. Yeah, I mean, creativity and, and fun is a lot easier to sustain than like a, an assembly line of boredom and and routine. And I think you hit a great point when talking about the tech companies, because I think they have the computer programmers and know-how to automate anything that is repetitive, right? They, they will just, a computer can do that. It can do that better and faster than a human. We don't need people to do data entry and and repetitive tasks anymore especially in the uh, the tech field so they need people to be creative they need people to come up with new solutions and innovative ways to do that and to keep uh, the business model growing and to reach new people and, and that's a lot more interesting and then I wanted to roll back to one thing you said because I think it's very interesting is uh, the toy business and your company's toy store. Because I think that's a, a, a great start and an interesting way to think about things. In my story, radio was that for me. I wanted to be in radio. I thought it'd be super cool. But I got into this sort of dying industry that was becoming obsolete through different channels of satellite radio and, and others and iPods and uh, all that kind of stuff right at that time in the early 2000s. But also when it was a job, it wasn't as fun for me as, as it was to pretend to be on the radio or to do my own thing. So did you find the same in the toy industry? And, and what were your lessons of growing up in that business? Hmm. I loved, loved the toy industry. Um, I, I loved the people. I loved interacting with the public and helping and serving them and listening to them. Um, we wore white lab coats, we were toyologists, we did prescriptions for fun. So it was about, you know, high service, you know, not your big box store where you just go in and get whatever was advertised on TV. This was, you know, right. listening to the customer. What is this child really like? Merchandising was so fun. Uh, but, you know, it, for me, yes, there was the compression of uh, children playing less. And it was more about expanding myself personal development professional mm. growth what else am I capable of I've kind of like I we had just won toy store of the year for all of Canada that year I had been on the news for 12 years and I felt kind of you know with my age too at that time I yeah I, you know was kind of at a milestone I was like if not now when and right. you know how long would I wait to try something else to try another path and you know I have a always had a traveler's mindset, a playful mindset, and that means trying new things. That's variety is a part of playing, you know, just when you think back to when you're a kid and you wanted to try all the toys, it wasn't just one toy. And so that's, that's for me, that's why I ended up exploring what was possible. I, you know, I sold that business within six weeks of listing it. It's now expanding this week to a new location. And I, wow. Yeah, and I just I had no plan of how this business would look what it I didn't even know about Lego Serious Play when I when I came into it. And so that was just one of the tools and I've expanded on that uh, quite a bit since then, keep discovering new ways to, to help teams work better together. That's uh, cool. I, I love that story. And you're right. I, I think we do still have a, a soft spot for that. And I think that screws up some adults too, is that you don't have to 
like throw it away and burn it to the ground to like move on and try something else. Like I still like let go as an adult and you know, that that's okay. And that we can maybe not do that thing for our job, but we can still love the industry and the people and stuff that were in there. I, I like that lesson uh, as well. What is the most fun you've ever had in your life? <laughs> the most fun. Um, I, when you were talking about that, though, I have to say, I was thinking about those Lego bricks, you know, like building on all the paths. So, you know, you have all those Lego bricks and we keep adding more bricks yeah. to food and even bigger um, creation. You know, I think a better fun. metaphor is like, we take those bricks apart and we can build yeah. something else. We like we still have all those them. skills and assets and the things and people that we collected along the way. It's just, we're going to reconfigure them into a, a new build. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's yeah. I love the rearranging part. And, and so I'm constantly rearranging and rethinking and reimagining, you know, where I'm at now. And part of that may have come from when you ask about my most fun, like I had a very fun childhood, very free range parents that mm. let me explore at age five, you know, anywhere in the town, I could go by myself, you know, walk a mile to school by myself at That's five. Great. And that translated to my teenage years as well, like lots of uh, freedom, which I try and instill in my own teenagers that they also have as much freedom and independence as they uh, can handle or, or want until proven otherwise. But that meant at 18, I graduated high school early to go off to Europe for eight months alone with no credit card, no email, no cell phones. These things did not exist. These old fashioned things called traveler's checks. And, yeah. uh, and it was amazing all by myself, not knowing where I was going to sleep at night, you know, rolling into town at 10 at night, no reservations, figuring out, uh, figuring out things as I went improvising basically. And I think that set me up for confidence, exploring, figuring out that, um, everything's figure outable, you know, like it may not turn out the way you expect, but it will turn out, you know, and it may be good, it may be bad, but you know, you will get to the other side regardless of the outcome. Um, and so, yeah, it was a great foundation for me, uh, at a young age, very formative and, and lots of fun, lots of misadventures. The best stories come from those misadventures. Yeah, I I think I, I've heard that a lot from our, our guests. I, I've done somewhere around, you know, 50 episodes now or so. And I think you're at least the the second or third person that has done like a good road trip and, and a, a good kind of backpacking adventure. And I think that is a common theme of, of playful people and people that want to make the most out of, of life, you know, that we're not just sitting back, you know, playing the regular game of, of check the box next in my, my career path that everybody else is doing and stuff. So I, I think that's a, a common thing of playful humans for sure. Mm -hmm. What about, um, have you ever gotten off track and, and lost it and, and found like burnout and, and boredom? And what did you do to get your creativity or voice back if, if that was the case? You know, it's funny. I, you know, boredom, I do recommend boredom for people like to not constantly like be on their phone and, you know, being distracted all the time so that we don't feel our feelings. Um, however, boredom, like I, really have not had a big relationship with boredom like I am just so curious and so fascinated by the world and there's books and there's you know conversations and there's nature and so boredom is not something that I can really relate to um you know maybe standing in a lineup you know like would be like without a phone would be you know, the closest. Well, I think there's a, uh, there's, I think it's Weezer line. If you're bored, then you're boring. That means right. you're not being yeah. creative right. enough, but uh, you didn't ever hit a wall of like burnout or, or something yeah. that, that was. So uh, burnout, the second part of the question, the burnout question is, um, is more relatable for me and something now that I'm helping coach people on and, and teams on preventing that, especially, you know, during these times that we're in. But I probably peaked for burnout when I had just had a baby. And um, the image that really comes to mind is being in the hospital after a C-section and covering the bed covers with uh, invoices that I needed to pay at the toy store. And I, and I had, you know, the papers brought with me and I was like calling suppliers and paying bills while I'm in bed at the hospital. Like when I could have been, I mean, the baby is sleeping. It's not like I'm enjoying right. the baby yeah, in yeah. that moment, but it was like, 
you know, what is going on here? And, you know, we're lucky here um, to have paid uh, maternity or paternity leave. So my husband could take time off. And, and so there, we did have balance uh, after that, but, you know, there were times when the kids were young where you were trying to juggle it all, you know, the young kids and the store and friends and family and exercise. And it, you know, it, it can be like, what ball are you willing to drop or let go of, you know, like maybe you can't have all the balls in the air at one time. You got to put a few, put a few aside or bounce a few. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's true for everybody. You, you find moments of, of overwhelm or just recorrect redirection. You know, it's like, ah, I was going this way, but maybe I went a little too fast. I said yes to one too many things at a time and I need to, to get back to, to what's important. What would you recommend for people that are feeling that now um, coming out of COVID and, and uh, getting back to some sort of new normal or, or at least being able to feel like we can play and explore a little bit more. If people are feeling cooped up and, and burnt out, what would you recommend? Hmm. Well, if people are feeling cooped up and burnt out, I mean, there's, there's the aspects of burnout that we can help ourselves where we can help ourselves finish the stress cycle so we can complete that and you know dive into like why did we get stressed in the first place you know like what caused this stress what can I do to change the situation and then we have to kind of look bigger picture like is this challenge about you know external circumstances that I have no control over and am I going to accept that or am I going to make a change and so I think that burnout is you know, people don't want to deal with it because it's a difficult, they're difficult questions to face, right? You know, like, am I ready to make a a serious change? And then we put ourselves in these prisons, these, you know, jail cells that are really just too sad, you know, like, it's open up behind us, but we're looking forward to the, to the jail bars and saying, oh, we're trapped, we're trapped, we're trapped. But no, actually, if you look behind you, you can go a different direction, but that is the harder harder way to look yeah so I would say it's not you know burnout isn't about bubble baths and self-care necessarily it is about asking like all those things help us deal with stress and anxiety and manage our every day and I don't want to negate any of those things and play is part of that you know it boosts our energy it helps us recharge you know having gratitude you know accepting reality um reframing situations there's there's a lot that goes into managing stress and anxiety and but for the burnout you know sometimes it's 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 a bigger question we need to ask is what's causing this yeah i think that's a really cool point for me because what i heard there was it's not about rest so much I, we hear that a lot as you know like you said meditation is great taking time off is good but if you're still bumping up against these same bars or these same roadblocks when you come back from meditation or come back from vacation, you get burnt out again really fast. And what I found with play and uh, other creative pursuits is it develops your ability to think of more options. That when you find other ways around these obstacles, you can keep moving, keep moving forward and get your energy back. But whatever you do, if you're, you're bumping up this stuckness, it, it's going to feel very melancholy and, and, and not very much fun if you're trying to pursue something that's not working. What you need to do is, is open it up and, and look around. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, and it reminds me of, you know, we talked about the tech industry and how it can be so innovative and open to creativity, but it can all, some parts of the tech industry can have a reputation for overworking um, their employees. Yeah. Not, not all of them, of course, but some, you know, like, you know, oh, we've got these foosball tables in the front. Look how playful we are. But it's a bunch of, you know, you've heard greenwashing, playwashing. Um, it's really just optics for those that are entering into the space. And they're not necessarily promoting a culture of playfulness that is not just about the way we think and the way we interact with people, but also are we taking time for play breaks? You know, are we actually having those rest periods that will make us uh, more productive? And, you know, having a Friday night um, happy hour is, does not a playful culture make, you know, <laughs> or yeah. nor does a foosball table. So when we prioritize play within the organization and we say, yeah, take that nature break, like take that 15 minutes uh, in between calls, have a dance break. And that is actively encouraged 
or you're having meetings where the check-ins are super playful right from the get-go from the start so that you can break down uh, barriers and um, communicate more openly and you can share your vulnerability more with your fellow colleagues. Like those are the types of things where people build um, psychological, I was certified in psychological safety too. And, and that's also a, a piece of it is just creating those psychologically safe environments where everyone feels like their voice is heard and included. Because if you're feeling like you're in a toxic environment, that's going to add to your burnout so much. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We see people not willing to take those breaks, but when they do, uh, all the studies show it re-energizes you enough that you're more productive when you come back. That if you just continue to grind and program 24-7, eventually you're going to slow down and your body is going to give out. That That's not yeah. sustainable. But yeah. when you play, you get creative, you take breaks, you sleep, you eat right, mm -hmm. you move your body, good things happen. You're more productive, you get more creative solutions and and have better results after doing those things. So my last question for you is, is there anything else left on your bucket list? What is your, uh, your fun bucket list of like something you would love to uh, accomplish? Mm. Well, the book is right up there, um, definitely. And um, I wouldn't mind playing on Necker Island. That's up there, you know. Um, you know, there's a lot of playful, pe you know, like, I would love to interview uh, people who have playful cultures, you know, that have really embedded that in their um, work and throughout their organization. And so that is, that is another piece. And if I was a chief play officer in a company, you know, I love doing my independent consulting and, um, you know, going from company to company and meeting all these different people and making a difference in their lives. And when they leave with tears in their eyes, I'm like, yes, you know, like this is so rewarding. Um, but it might be fun also to be within an organization, maybe part time and just be their chief play officer or their playologist or whatever, you know, whatever that title is, but that could be fun too. And just see, uh, be able to see the transformation from, you know, point A to point B and be there a little bit longer term. That could be fun too. So, you know what, I'm always playing with, uh, the bucket list and adding new buckets. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> awesome. You? I, I, I want to know what great. yours is now. <laughs> Uh, it, well, first I want to tell everybody, if you want more information on Kirsten, go to Kirsten playing on social media or integrateplay.com to find her. And I'm going to integrate some play into our podcast episode right now, but on my fun bucket list, I would love to do a concert again. I got, um, I was lucky enough to open for Billy Idol and another time for Frankie Valley and the four seasons here in Kansas city. And doing a stage that that is that size of like 12,000 um in a sea of people is a totally different experience than even 2 3,000 people in a, a large conference or, or something it's just a totally different energy and it was super fun other than that i probably have the same um travel dreams as everybody else go somewhere fun to to play like uh, galapagos or uh, yeah. or something interesting like that yeah like pretty much everywhere I haven't been for the map is like on the bucket list. <laughs> right. I, I've only been to like two places outside the United States. So I got a lot of places I could play, but, uh, awesome. but definitely uh, sounds like a plan. So do you want to play or do you want to walk away? Oh yeah. Let's play. Of course. <laughs> okay. We're spinning our wheel of games. I forgot to tell you we were going to do this. So this is a surprise for you and it'll be fun. Uh, you got survey says survey says is pretty easy. You've probably seen it on, uh, TV before we surveyed a hundred people. We're looking for the top five answers on the board. If you get two out of three, uh, you win our game here. <laughs> Name something people do in their cars where, while stopped at a red light. Name something people do. Look in their at their phone. Stopped at a red light. Uh, phone is the number two answer. Number two answer. Number one was adjusting the radio. So uh, good yeah. answer. Good answer. Name a kind of place where you would hate to be seated near a screaming baby. An airplane. Airplane for sure. Somehow that is the number three answer. <laughs> uh, movie theater was number one. Restaurant oh. number two. But I think our <laughs> survey was wrong there. Uh, at a party, name something you might offer to do to help the hostess. Um, put food out. 
Good. Sir Food, also the number two answer. You nailed all the number twos. Uh, <laughs> Clean up was the number one answer. Yeah. But that's three in a row, which means you win. And that gets you a free 30-second commercial. Any asks or, or gives for the audience today, how can we help you? Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, no, I... Um... Hmm. Ask or gives. I'm just, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. And if people want to get in touch, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, I don't know if I have any like resources per se, but I might have something if they're looking for something I could send them. Yeah. <laughs> well, and certainly you can facilitate a workshop. So if you're looking for a, a corporate team building event, or you want to get more creative or deal with some of those issues that we've talked about here today, go to Kristen playing on social media or integrateplay.com. Once again, I'm Mike Montague with the Playful Humans, and you can go to playfulhumans.com to find things like our playfulness quiz, but also connect with other adults, rediscovering the power of play. And what that means is just encouraging people to put it out there. Go do something silly, make something, create something, go do something, be something fun and playful here in the next year. Start right now. Go join the club at playfulhumans.com. Until next time, subscribe to this podcast. Give us a thumbs up. Share this episode right now. We'll see you next time. Go play. Don't wait for tomorrow. Live for today. Keep on chasing the sunshine. And go out and play. Bye, everybody.